In 2012, the United Nations announced that it would observe International Day to end obstetric fistula on May 23rd each year. This has been religiously observed by the UN, the media, and other non-governmental um, organizations to promote actions towards treating and preventing fistula, a condition that affects many girls and women. An estimated 2 to 3 million women and girls in developing countries are living with obstetric fistula. To commemorate this day, we will be joined by someone you probably only know as one of Africa's foremost actress and filmmaker, Stephanie Linus, but there is so much more. Beyond her work as an actress, she is passionate about women's rights and strongly advocates against early child marriage. Through her foundation, Extended Hands, she has done extensive work in the field of vesico-vaginal fistula. She's currently the United Nations Population Fund Regional Ambassador on Maternal and Reproductive Health for West and Central Africa. She was awarded Nigeria's fourth highest award, member of the Order of the Federal Republic. Her foundation, Extended Hands, helped women with fistula by providing free surgeries and has repaired over 200 women and girls with fistula. Hello, Stephanie. Hello, how are you doing? Fine, thank you. I hope you are keeping safe this period. I'm trying. So your movie, Dry, released in 2015, was focused on vesicle vaginal fistula and has since inspired your foundation, Extended Hands, and of course, the amazing work you're doing. When was the first time you learned of this condition and how, why did this condition move you to compassion? Um, well, thank you for having me on your show. Um, the first time I heard about fistula was in 20, 2002, if I'm correct. I was still an undergraduate at the university and a friend of mine came from Unijos to visit me and then she, you know, she just started narrating some of the experiences, just things that she has seen over there, like young girls getting married and having this particular condition called um, fistula. So I was like, really, how is that possible? I mean, we're all in the same country, but we're having different experiences. And look at us, where we have the rights, we have the liberty to go to school, decide what happens to our body, decide when to get married, decide all of that. So in my head, I think it just... And I, I am someone who hates injustice. So I think I just saw, wow, this is completely, you know, someone's rights being taken away from them. And this is just injustice. And that thought really never left me. You know, somehow I just felt like Fistula sort of like found me. But I, I wasn't thinking about it. I never had met anyone that had Fistula at the time. I became interested in it. So that passion just, you know, like, no, there's a way we can actually stop. What can I do? So I think it got to a point where I started asking myself right from um, university, like, what can I do? How can I help? So I just started researching. The more I researched, the more I found out more information about this. And then I said, okay, where can I volunteer? What organizations can I volunteer my time just to learn more? And, you know, so I just started asking, what can I do? How can I help? How can I just add a little bit of um, my own contribution to what is going on? So how long did it take you to research and decide that you want to start from the movie dry? Uh, it, it took a while. It, it, it took a process. You know, sometimes you just say, I am going to do this. And then I was still coming up in my career as an actress, you know, in 2002. So you can imagine when I said that and it happened how many, almost how many years down the line. So I, I think the more I research and the more I keep saying it, I, the more I research, I just felt, there's a big gap, you know, that is missing, which is really bringing the awareness and letting people know. Because a lot of people that I've met didn't really know about fistula. So by the time you educate them, they're like, their eyes kind of like pop up, like, really? You know, oh, it's true. Well, I'm like, okay, that's what's happening to this person. So that I just felt there's a, there was a need to create an awareness. So it took me quite some time. It took me... Um, just researching and um, I'm getting the information. And then I think I was able to shoot the film in 2012. That's when I did the movie. And, um, you know, and since then, it's just been a beautiful ride. And, and I hope that the movie will achieve what we set. You know, the whole essence is to eradicate festival in Africa. And I hope that the movie will help achieve that. Mm, just like you said, what has Dry achieved so far? Like what distinguished role would you say it has played? It's done quite a lot. Where the fact that I'm having this interview, it's 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 all about dry and me talking about fistula. So that means you as a person is informed. 
So which is the whole essence, the fact that you are informed, you're going to inform somebody else, you understand, because it will inform somebody else. So what Dry has done was to bring an attention to the story, was to give it a human face for people to get to understand it more, because everyone that has seen Dry is always, they're always moved. They were like, what can I do? How can I help? You know, how can we help the conversation? Even people who are going through the condition who say, oh my God, you, you've told my story, you told it so well. You know, I'm more aware. Even people who are even in the NGO world, when they get to see the film, they're like, you know, now I am even more passionate to even do more. So Dry has achieved a lot of things by creating awareness, we'll still do more. Even for instance, when we showed it in Gambia, and a few months later, they banned child marriage in Gambia. And the fact that a lot of prominent people in Nigeria, even now, are talking about maternal health issues, people are becoming more aware about that, people are becoming more concerned with men's issue. It's also the fact that they saw dry and they felt it's about time they start doing um, a couple of things. So somebody, different countries are more proactive than the other, but you know, it's just something you, you keep moving, keep pushing till you get the actual desired result that you want to achieve. Mm. Um, personally, I think that you chose um, the medium of filmmaking because you are in that um, um, industry. But looking at it holistically, how can the media, both new media, traditional media, social media, however you want to categorize it, be used to get um, the required impact in this regard? It's just to constantly create awareness because the media is powerful, you know, it being a tool to change perception and, you know, pass on information over the years. And that's also what you guys do. So it, it's to find a way to pass the right kind of information and, you know, give people the tools that they need to be able to be enlightened and also where they can find help. So we even with dry, like people, you know, when people ask me, the dry, you did it so many years ago and you're still going on. I say yes, because we did it because it's a mission for the film. The film is supposed to make sure that people become aware, you know, we take it to all the nooks and crannies of different places so that people can actually see the film and change their behaviors. So that one click or just seeing that film, you don't know how impactful it could be in someone changing the cause of their life. Mm. Just like seeing that and making a decision about how they want to better themselves. So the media, what we need to do is pass information that first, this thing can be cured. And this is where you can actually get help. Now, are there efforts that you have noticed um, to ensure that this condition gets the required attention from the Ministry of Health? Well, there have been efforts. I think, um, are we doing enough? No. Uh, uh, do we need to have more passionate people who, because I, I because how I see it, there have been effort, you know, to, 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 to some extent, but sometimes when I go on, uh, on the field, I feel like if we're all really determined to get rid of this thing, we can actually do it. I mean, Fisla was eradicated in the, in the Western world, so why should we be, you know, going through this thing. So first of all, we have to check our healthcare system in terms of the maternal facility, especially for women who are pregnant and all the information that needs to pass on. So if we're really determined, I think it's something that we can actually eradicate. So that's how I see it. Mm. So, but are they trying? Yes, but can they do more and better? I think, yes, you know, that's what the government needs to do. So, but also it requires a collective effort because the government alone cannot do it because that's where the awareness creation comes in. And that's where I'm actually, you know, trying to focus a lot of, uh, of our time and energy on by educating the people. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, let me paint the scenario this way, although, although we need the laws to be enforced so that, you know, people can also comply. But you as a parent, you know, even the law say, oh, okay, the child is gonna be the approval age of 13. Do you want to do that to your kid? Do you understand? So you also have the power in your, you also have the power to, de to decide when you want your child to get married or if you want to give your child away to marriage and all of that. But again, that's also the, the main cause of not having adequate facilities for pregnant women when they want to deliver. So those are some of the education that needs to, to happen for the individual to use some of the facilities and also for the facilities to be upgraded. Okay, so the support your foundation is getting at the moment are majorly from corporate organizations. Now, while drawing their attention to these women and the help they need, how would you rate the awareness of this condition, considering that women in this part of this world, with the kind of health system um, we have, are at high risk of experiencing something that we can say is preventable? 
So that's what we're doing the awareness creation. And also that's what we're also trying to like we go to different hospitals and try to find a way how we can help to upgrade them in terms of their look and also in terms of the facilities that they need. And then we'll go into the community to stick those women and say, hey, there's a facility close to you. This is where you, you can actually use this facility or, you know, just give them basic information on how to get help. You know, that's what we're doing right now. So we're also trying to magnify and increase this capacity so that it's not something we, in the next couple of years we should be dealing with. It's something that that information is there and everybody sort of like know what to do. And then the facilities are there for them to use it. Mm. So what cultural and religious barriers have you experienced while trying to help repair these women? There's been a lot, you know, but we should also focus more on there are like the direct and indirect causes of fistula, which is the majority of the number one um, cause is the prolonged labor. A woman who is in labor and her labor is prolonged, she might have a high risk of, you know, having fistula, and especially if she does not have access to good medical care during the time of delivery. So that's actually huge. And then sometimes some women um, might actually go, meet some people or some doctors who are not really qualified to do a cesarean session and they end up having fistula. So we've seen cases like that, that it's not, you know, it's not even the prolonged labor, it's trying to have cesarean session that, you know, they end up having fistula. And they a whole lot of other causes. But also the indirect causes, which is what you're talking about in terms of the cultural practices that these people are doing. Um, well, in terms of the early marriage, the genital mutilation that, that we have, um, and uh, all the different cultural beliefs that people are practicing. And this is some of the things that where the awareness creation comes in to actually educate the people. And what I did with my film was I try not to play too much on religion. What I did was to present the, the, the girl to them and say, okay, this is a girl when she was young, you guys love her, all of a sudden she's married off to this guy and then she has this disease and then you guys abandon her. So is this the way to go? So, and this is because of these actions that you guys took at this time uh, by not waiting. These are, these are the consequences of the things that happened to her. And so is this, do you want this to continue to happen to all your girls? So this is this like food for thought for you to look inward as the person to actually know the consequences of some of these choices that you make or your so-called religion or culture commits but these are the and these are the consequences of that so those those are the things that we bring to their attention to say if you do this these are the consequences of the things that you're going to have do you want to continue to do that or do you want to change your ways hmm. so i suppose some level of um, knowledge can help prevent this condition for women and girls are there currently awareness programs for prevention and how do we create more awareness oh, yeah there's there's been Quite some, yes, and they, we just have to continue, you know. And that's why you having this meeting today talking about fistula um, is a great one to get people to understand that. And actually, that fistula can happen to anyone because sometimes there's this notion that is a northern thing. Um, it's not a not yes, majority of some of our cases are also in the north, but we have them in the south because. I've done fistula repairs in the south, in Ibadan, in Ugoja, in Ebony, and all these other places, Quara, and all these other places. So it's also something that can actually happen to anyone. If a woman is in labor, in labor and her labor is prolonged and she does not have access to good medical care, there's a possibility that she might have fistula. So those are some of the education that people need to understand, and every woman should understand that this can actually happen to anyone. So what are the ways in which we can prevent that from happening. So enough awareness, education, and you telling the other person um, more about FISTA, just sharing a lot of a lot of information about that can actually help. Mm. Okay, finally, before and I let you go. the government stepping up, the government stepping up by taking the maternal health situation in Nigeria, as in taking it seriously, because a lot of women are dying in childbirth and just really taking that seriously, because I don't think any woman should die while trying to give birth to life. So that is something that the government needs to make sure that it's all, you know, it's top of their priority by making sure the maternal health care system in Nigeria is, um, um, is properly upgraded. Okay, so before I let you go, as individuals, um, how can people help very quickly? Uh, people just sharing information, I think, and also, if you're, a, if you're a doctor, and because also 
one of the things that there, there are not a lot of fistula surgeons in Nigeria. Uh, so to get people to be interested in fistula work and um, doctors to also um, be interested in becoming fistula surgeons. Um, if you're in a position to help, it depends on what position. So if you're a normal citizen, passing on the information, uh, if you know how to um, press on the government to pass the stringent laws that we need to help the maternal health situation. Uh, if you're a counselor, if you're some, if someone, in, a leader in the community, how to educate your people to make sure that, you know, this are the information and they make sure that they adhere to that. So I think all of us have a role to play. You as a parent, making the right decision for your child, you know, and making sure that you you protect that child and, and, and make sure that at least let her have the basic education to be able to decide what happens to her body and to even be able to take care of her, herself. So um, there's a lot that we all can do depending on who and what role you play. So um, but basically just sharing information too can also help and pressing the government to upgrade the maternal health situation in Nigeria. And right. corporate organization, if there are ways you can help up, um, upgrade a hospital or a facility or things, you can actually help. Okay. And you in the media constantly talking about it, bringing to light different things and, you know, putting the government on their toes to actually do what they're supposed to do. Thank you for your time That's and the work you're doing with Extended Hands Foundation. Okay, thank you very much. All right. It's time for a quick break, but when we return, we'll be speaking to a medical practitioner who will shed more light on this condition. Thank you, Elsie. Uh, with me today is Dr. Saad Idris, the Chief Consultant Fistula Surgeon and a FIGO Certified International Fistula Trainer. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you. What actually does the term fistula mean? Basically, a fistula is an abnormal connection between one organ and another organ. If we come to a literal term of how people understand a fistula, if this is a room, and that is the door outside, the normal door, then there is a hole here an abnormal hole which somebody can now enter the other room. So it's like a fistula. So a fistula is an abnormal co uh, connection between one organ and another organ. It could be between the intestine and outside. It is called enterocutaneous fistula in the medical term. It could be from uh, the throat here to outside like a fistula, so any abnormal connection. But vesicovaginal fistula means an abnormal connection between vesico, that is the bladder, and vagina, which is the vagina. So abnormal connection, connection between bladder, that is the urinary organ where the urine is stored, and then the vagina. Now, uh, since you have said it's an abnormal connection, how challenging and delicate is the fistula surgery? It's actually a very delicate uh, uh, surgery because it's a surgery that you cannot find two pistillis the same. You know, if you are doing like, for instance, an operation to remove a baby, it's an art, unless if there is complication, you open, you get to the womb, open the womb and remove a baby. But in pistilla, each pistilla has its own unique characteristics. And it's not a single field, it's not a single specialty. It combines where the urine goes in and the people who specialize with urinary tract are called urologists. Then the people who specialize in babies and deliveries and then vagina, they are called gynecologists. And sometimes it involves even where the pieces, this two comes out. So those again are called colorectal surgeon or general surgeon. So it's a combination of 
multi specialty sometimes you even use plastic surgeries because you have to have vest tissue from another place to come and close the hole and again it is a surgery done in a very tiny space so one needs to learn many many things before you can become an expert and that is why it is really a very delicate surgery and there are some situation where the tissue are really dead they are not there so you have to really think of how to move. in fact sometimes you have to use intestine to really do the operation so it's a very delicate surgery compared to all other surgical disciplines you have talked about how complex the condition is about how much does it cost in nigeria yes um Actually, because of the fact that most of the fistula surgeries are done in collaboration with non-governmental organizations and the government, the outright cost is not readily known by many people. But if you come into cities like maybe in Abuja here, or maybe people who do the real costing, including mom power, the school personnel, and the length of stay. It's really an expensive surgery. There was a cost, costing done by some non-governmental organizations. They arranged an average pistola surgery to be 250 to 350,000. But if it is in reality of including the personnel, and then the length of stay of the patient, we are talking about 500 and above, 500,000 naira and above. So it's really a, an expensive surgery, very, very expensive. From our research, we found out that there's a global shortage of fistula surgeons. And you have confirmed this, talking about the complexity of performing this fistula surgery. How do you think this can be remedied? There has to be real commitment, catching young people well, right from the one and then make them to have interest. That is number one. Then coming to training a surgeon, a younger surgeon who can do some minor, not really complex surgical operations, being it gynae or general surgery or plastic or urology, then gets into the training, there has to be interest. There has to be motivations and there has to be continuity. And unfortunately, because it's not a field that is stand alone for now because of the, how uh, it has not been there as an isolated field, so not too many expertise are there. So you have to be traveling from one place to another, maybe from countries to countries, so that you can have a lot of experience. And finally, you just have to get, for one to be super specialist in pistola surgery, has to go into one surgery, either general surgery or obstetrics and gynecological surgery or plastic or urology, then again you add fistula on top. So it's really, really very delicate. And then sometimes because of the complexity, the work can be done one time, twice, thrice, even four times without, and people tend to run away because of the delicate uh, complexity. But I believe with campaign awareness creation and showing, uh, putting younger ones to show interest and then commitment and then involvement in the training institutions and as a whole government commitment will be able to get younger medical personnel that can become an expert in the future. How can the condition fistula, especially vesico vagina fistula, how can its cases be reduced within Nigeria and Africa as a whole? Yes, uh, uh, you see, uh, pistilla is a morbidity, or let me say a condition in which 
a woman survive level and level complication. I mean, level and then ends up with complication. You know, anything that you can do to reduce maternal mortality, deaths of a woman from pregnancy and delivery, will now go a long way to reduce uh, uh, fistula, especially vasico vagina fistula. One, education. There has to be awareness creation, girl child education, because there are level of preventions, primary, secondary, tertiary, but because of timing, let me start with primary prevention, awareness creation, girl child education, awareness even by the community itself, then again, good road transport network well, so that if a woman is pregnant, she can easily access maybe a place where if she cannot deliver, she can access a place where she can have a safe delivery. Then antenatal visit, visit antenatal. Then our secondary centers where in case the woman is not able to deliver, she can go to a hospital and ready for a safe cesarean section. And then even if she delivers, like in uh, tertiary prevention, even if she is delivering and the labor becomes prolonged, she, they can use an indwelling catheter for some time, depending on the level of education, and with training and retraining of personnel, so equipping the, and then political will, I believe fistula can be reduced, the number of fistula can be reduced. We have also found out that the condition is prevalent in the south-south and in the north, and you talked about education and community awareness education of the girl child, can we link this to the number of conditions in the north and these areas affected by the high cases of vesicle vagina fistula? Actually, education will go a long way in reducing maternal mortality and especially maternal morbidity like vesicle vagina fistula. So in the north, we need this education. In fact, all over the country, in fact, all over Africa, we need this. But if we focus on Nigeria, because we have the highest body in the world, I suppose, and you see more cases, more cases, more cases in the north, but they are all there everywhere, to be honest with you. I think education, education, education and awareness creation will go a long way in reducing the cycle of vagina fistula. Ending fistula is an integral component of achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030. A woman suffering fistula is a violation of human rights. All women should have safe medical care to ensure that she does not have to fear dying or having fistula while giving birth to the next generation. We must begin to pay attention to our healthcare system and policies to ensure that preventable calamities such as fistula does not befall women. My name is Elsie Godwin. Keep watching Plus TV Africa and do stay safe. <laughs>